equivalent of the old days of going into a, uh, you know, ripping the hard drive out of a computer, uh, reading the contents, doing a modification and putting it back so that you can gain that persistent access you need. The nice thing is OSINT comes in really helpful here. Chip manufacturers uh, almost always publish their data sheets. Uh, always the first place to start this along with photos from the FCC's test database. Um, and the FCC publishes all this stuff. So this is a chip used in a lot of IP video cameras and it shows how to implement it in a bunch of situations. And it shows us a bunch of stuff we're probably interested in looking at here to get initial access to a device that maybe uses this chip. So from a debug standpoint, we see, okay, you are, there's support for serial consoles here for on-chip debugging. Um, there's support for SPI, which is one of the protocols used for persistent storage access that we can access and NAND, which we can get access to flash on these devices. Awesome, cool, probably things we wanna target. Uh, also, uh, the pinouts for the chips are available. So we can look at, okay, you you know, the data sheet says that there's a UART console on this chip. Where on the actual circuit board is it exposed? And usually that's published and documented. And we can just start looking that up and reversing the traces on the actual circuit board. So I'll pull some examples. You know, we just, we bought a cheap TP-Link router off Amazon just to, um, just to you know, tear it down and provide some examples of this stuff. So we can learn a lot from just looking at the hardware. So all these devices, the first thing is uh, in terms of how, how we do this systematically and at scale, just have a system and methodology for identifying chips, correlating to their data sheets and getting that key information out of them. So now I've built a little database that I keep of all the chips I commonly see so that we can um, reference that and quickly know what kind of IO they have. So, you know, if we look at this circuit board, we see, okay, a MediaTek CPU, the RAM, the flash storage, which we're gonna be really interested in extracting. It probably has firmware. Um, always interesting on hardware, we see these four pins here sticking up out of the circuit board on the right, uh, not connected to anything. So that provides us a thought of, okay, so what does connect to that thing? You know, when was it used? Was it used in development or manufacturing? Uh, very often on circuit boards, we'll see um, spaces that should have chip, that look like they should have a chip attached to it, but they don't. Again, what was the intent there? What was it used for? Conversely, we're starting to see more and more in a lot of devices, extra chips on there that provide functionality that's not necessarily advertised on devices. So as an example, in home gateways, we're starting to, in home internet gateways, um, I've been seeing uh, more and more Bluetooth and Zigbee wireless chips in there. And you're thinking, okay, you know, the manufacturers must be doing some kind of home IoT play here. They're not advertising it on the box yet, what's going on? Those are all interesting things to look at. So I mentioned that four pin unpopulated header. Um, this is the quickest thing you can look for on every circuit board. It's the universal. This is going to be a serial console sign. If you take away nothing else about hardware security, this is probably the easiest thing you can always look for. Uh, nicely on this one, uh, the manufacturer also decided to label the pins on the circuit board to tell us, hey, there's RX, the serial receive, TX, serial transmit. There's a debug console here. They labeled it. Great, thanks. Um, so what do we do with that? Well, we can hook up a simple logic analyzer and just look at the um, look at the logic levels, the binary data coming out of it. Um, serial consoles operate um, at standard, you know, old school modem speeds. Uh, the most common of which we see is one one five two hundred baud. You know, analyze those eight bits at a time, what's coming out of that serial console. Awesome, we're recovering ASCII text. Okay, cool. Yes, there's something here in the hardware we can get access to. Um, there are these little $10 devices um, that uh, interface between UART serial and USB called an FTDI, hook it up. Great, we're getting boot logs from the device. Often also this allows us access to a bootloader where we can do things like set the environment variables that are used for boot. So here's an example uh, that uh, I did against a Qualcomm uh, chip 
which was get into the bootloader, set the environment variables um, to, uh, didn't work the first time, but init equals bin sh, right? So the device starts up and it starts a console so that we can get into it. We save those environment variables, restart. Awesome, that might give us access. But what we're starting to see, all good things have to come to an end. Um, you know, the serial consoles via hardware has been a mainstay of, you know, initial persistent access to embedded devices for a long time. Talked about a lot of security conferences, manufacturers are wising up to this uh, and starting to lock down serial. So toward the end, once we get to talking to firmware, I'm gonna give you a demo of a new open source tool we're releasing to help um, uh, subvert some of those locks that manufacturers are putting in place so we can actually get access to these things. So that works, maybe, maybe not. What do we do next? Okay, well, where does that firmware come from? We had that picture of the circuit board with our flash memory here. During boot up of this device, the contents of this flash memory chip need to be communicated to the CPU so that it gets its operating system and it can access all of the executables it needs to run, things like this. So we have an opportunity to read, potentially modify what's on that chip. Now, this simple type of chip is called uh, SPI flash or SPI flash. It uses a four pin communication system with essentially a um, serial in, serial out, a clock. So in comparison to UART serial that I talked about earlier that just uses a set baud rate, this uses a, um, a clock that's maintained usually in a couple hundred kilohertz clock um, and a chip select essentially an enable pin. And again, look up the data sheet, we see a ton of these Micronics or MXIC spy flash chips across a huge range of devices. Look up the data sheet, we can get the pin out of it. If we look at what those signals actually look like on real chips while a device is booting. So again, this is that TP-Link router example. We hooked up a logic analyzer to those serial pins and we see all that communication starting. So when the device boots, in box one here, we see this top line, that's the enable or chip select pin goes low, which low and for a lot of these protocols means active. Um, that goes low saying, yes, I'm gonna start talking to this flash chip. The clock starts oscillating, great. Then we see serial data coming out in box two. That's probably a command for a read then in box three here, we see the other serial channels start to go low and see serial data here. Luckily, we don't need to do all this stuff manually. Uh, if you have a Raspberry Pi, there's a great open source uh, toolkit called FlashROM that you can use. You just hook up the GPIO pins on your Raspberry Pi and it can dump all of the data off those five flash chips. Uh, there's also um, some uh, cheap purpose-made hacking tools like the good fat um, that's super easy to just hook up, dump, read, write the flash on these devices. The industry standard for then, what do you do with this stuff? So you get a big blob of binary data. How do you actually analyze it is binwalk. Um, and what binwalk does is it's gonna walk through that um, blob of data and look for um, strings, header information so that we can start to extract what's actually on there. Um, and at usually, and most of these devices are Linux based, we actually um, we actually get back a uh, Linux file system. This starts to get a little more complicated. If you pull apart uh, some more advanced recent devices, this is one of the, not the most recent generation Alexa, but um, a little bit before this, um, uh, like Gen 2 maybe, um, you'll see chips that look like this uh, for their persistent storage. Um, these are harder to work with. You have to remove them using an IR oven if you have it or hot air gun. Um, and then you get something that looks like this. It's a ball grid array. Um, the only difference being you need $100 of tools instead of $20 of tools to interface with this, but still possible 
So we grabbed this chip off an Alexa, walked through it, and got a file system back. Um, for the commenter in the channel, um, on the topic of the there should be a chip, the Bloomberg 2018 article, um, definitely, uh, you know, if anyone hasn't read it, uh, the Bloomberg's big hack article, you know, take with it what you will. There's a, still a ton of debate in the industry, what was true, what was not true. Um, but it did bring up the um, importance of hardware validation and hardware security in the manufacturing process. So it's a good one to good one to mention. Uh, let, let us not forget, however, sometimes we can take the easy route and, you know, companies like Linksys, which I'll demo on, uh, uh, have published all their firmware online. So uh, you can go download it. You don't need to go through this rigmarole. Uh, but let me jump into a demo, show you, cool, we have some firmware. What do we actually do with it? I'm going to pop over to terminal here. So um, cool, I have this links this image from a WHW302 prod. It's the first router that they were advertising on their main homepage and I downloaded the firmware. But so we can run bin walk across that to start seeing huh, what's in this. Okay, Linux kernel. ARM boot executable. That's good to know. So we've confirmed this device is Linux based, it is ARM architecture. Cool. We see a little further down, there's some compressed image, uh, some compressed data here. Don't quite know what that is. This UBI file system. I know that Binwalk doesn't always do the greatest job extracting UBI. So for this one last night, I manually carved that out and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, but we can run bin walk across it to tell us what's actually in this weird blob of data. Um, I'm going to just exit out of there because taking a little bit. The other thing we can do just to see what's in there, just run strings, right? Okay. What's in this thing? Is there anything interesting to us? Do we see, you know, a hard coded password, something that says private key, whatever it is. Okay. You know, there's some text in here. It doesn't look encrypted. I bet we'll, you know, yeah, we're finding actual human readable text in some of these. So let me switch over here. Um, I'll show you what, when we actually carve out the file system from one of these devices, what this looks like. Um, it, you should all recognize this as a pretty standard Linux file system, right? You have your binary executables, you know, Etsy directory, your libraries here. Um, on a lot of embedded devices, you have your um, embedded web server. So you have all the static content and handlers for um, your embedded web server. Cool, you can start doing some analysis on these. So if we were to do all of this manually, where do we start, right? Well, we probably want to start looking for hard-coded uh, passwords and keys. So great, pop into the Etsy directory. I looked at this one a little earlier. We don't have anything in password or shadow files. So there's no hard-coded credential on it. Um, but we do have, um, I think under the search directory, okay, server.pem. Hmm, that's interesting looking. Let's pop that open. What do we see? Um, ha, huh, okay, hard-coded private key. I'm sorry to whoever's private key, is now on a conference talk, you should probably rotate your key. Um, but that's the type of stuff that we're gonna, that, that we're gonna see a ton in um, across devices, right? Um, I noticed on this device, I have never seen so many shell scripts control every aspect of how this device works from how it determines who's connected to its uh, Wi-Fi network, to how it does some security stuff, a firewall, everything. This makes me think there are a lot of opportunities for command injection, right? So we can start looking through and saying, okay, what are all the things here? How are they controlled? Where do the inputs come from? Looking for opportunities there, right? Let's pop over to libraries. Um, when we're in libraries here, we see there are a lot of, so like libcrypt, libdbus, um, 
libuc, libc. Um, there are a lot of very standard Linux libraries compiled into this binary. So we can start going through and looking at saying, okay, what version of the binaries are in there? Uh, and what are the known CVEs against it? Um, as you're probably going to sense from everything I'm talking to, you know, there's a pretty standard process that you can follow with going through these. Um, it's slow. <laughs> and that's the issue that I constantly uh, run into is, you know, how do you, you can't necessarily spend 80 hours digging through a file system and loading up binaries. So we're going to talk a little bit about program analysis and automation and how we can get beyond that. Oop, that is not the right thing. There we go. So that's manual firmware analysis. If you haven't downloaded some firmware and used Binwalk, give it a shot uh, to and start poking through it and see what you find. So let's talk about program, program analysis to do vulnerability discovery. So the good news, if you can call it that, is in embedded devices, um, the vulnerabilities and problems are, are those of yesterday in other, in other uh, security domains. It's things like stack buffer overflows, uh, command injection, and it's really rare to have any sort of um, ASLR or um, binary exploit mitigations that are common uh, for uh, computers. Uh, it's it's fairly uncommon to see them against um, against embedded devices. We see constant buffer sizes, unchecked bounds, tons of opportunities. So what can we start looking for if we were to automate this process? Well, we can look for vulnerable C functions. Things like um, stir copy, printf, system calls, mem copy, things that may take an input from one place and execute it or write it to memory without checking, right? So a really common example of that is a stack buffer overflow where we take something in uh, from whatever source it may be. And let's say we do a string copy to copy that input to a buffer, but we don't check the size of it and make sure that, um, that it fits within the allocated buffer. Well, on these devices, because there are no binary ex exploit mitigations, we might be able to overwrite, let's say, the return address. As, and as an attacker, we can insert uh, an input that will chain, that will return us when the function returns to a different uh, address to potentially execute code that we've loaded onto that device. So cool. We want to start finding things like that in, in um, in our firmware. And we have to do this because of the billions of devices coming online and just the millions of unfilled cybersecurity positions. We have to start figuring out how we automate it. So I looked at some at uh, 175 devices that uh, me and my team had done over the last couple of years, uh, 2,225 vulnerability findings. To give you a sense on those uh, hardware and firmware vulnerabilities, we found 234 issues related to serial consoles. Some devices have more than one. Sometimes it provides you access to more than one thing. 70 devices that gave us bootloader access, 42 that gave us root access to um, via serial consoles without any major, major work. Uh, 52 devices with command injection, usually in the web UI of the, um, of the automated uh, web UI of the embedded devices. 56 with buffer overflows. Cool, awesome, interesting stats, but that took like three years or something to do, right? That's a lot of stuff. I want to do more of it. So how do people approach automation to this stuff today? Well, a lot of people do source code analysis. Um, that works really well in some domains. Uh, it works less well in embedded devices and um, firmware due to a couple issues. One, we usually don't have the firmware, right? Or we don't have the source code, apologies. Um, and uh, we want to still do security analysis against it, but we can get the firmware from the vendor's website off the chips, right? Um, the other issue is that um, when you compile firmware for a device, so I'm going to pick on this router. Oh, I just dropped my demo. OK, when we compile, um, the firmware for this router, um, the um, there are a whole ton of things that get compiled in from the chip vendor. Like, for example, if you use a standard third-party Wi-Fi chip, 
um, you don't have access to their source code for the firmware. Um, and we need to um, be able to analyze that. The vendor doesn't give it to us, so we have to analyze from the firmware angle. The other thing is uh, we want to start doing this before these devices get into the field. And a lot of the current techniques, you know, if you load up a firmware in IDA and you get a culture graph that looks like this, no amount of monster energy lets you do that. Um, so good question in the uh, Discord about um, to exploit most of these hardware vulnerabilities, you need physical access. So yes, to get things like a serial console or to utilize JTAG debugging on devices, you need physical access. Um, however, most of the time you're using that access that you obtain on one device to you know, get access to the firmware, leave a persistent network connection open so that it's sort of an, an what I find is that it's sort of the initial entry point to allow you to gain a ton of information to do future exploits. So buy one device, exploit many in the future. All right. So how do we leverage uh, automated analysis against firmware? So there are some open source tools, uh, Firmflaw and others. Um, I kind of ran through real quick. We all know how to poke through Linux file systems and find maybe a password in a shadow file. Uh, what I found is my team started scripting a lot of those things against file systems. And we ended up, I'll show you what we did to kind of toss all our scripts in one place uh, to automate this stuff. Um, we created a little pipeline that we run firmware through to extract it. Uh, and extract all the weird file system formats to analyze it and produce some vulnerability results. Um, at uh, Echo Party in this past year, we did a little 20 devices in 45 seconds talk about, uh, against a bunch of these types of devices. And here's the kind of things that you can find in automated program analysis. So we're going to take a Tenda AC1900. It's a router made by Tenda. My favorite feature of it is anti-hacking, which, you know, as a security professional, always makes you want to take a look at it. Um, so I mentioned, you know, things we want to look for are uh, printf vulnerabilities, system calls. But we find a bunch of system calls in this. And we found a few that were exploitable. Uh, from the web UI. So input from a user on the web UI is ex uh, exploitable for command injection. Uh, there's a CV on it three years ago, still unpatched and the most recent firmware. And we can automatically show that it's vulnerable. Um, this code will look a little weird because it's um, recovered. For, it's not actually source code. It's um, a representation, it's uh, medium level IL um, recovered from the actual binary. But we can see, so V5 here is our uh, vulnerable um, vulnerable value that ends up getting passed to system unsanitized. And uh, we got a command injection. I mentioned printf as another really common type of vulnerability. This is another um, Tendo router that has another printf vulnerability that we can, again, automatically using program analysis, um, get uh, be able to understand that that's vulnerable. Um, and we see um, the vulnerable input being passed to printf here for command injection. And I'm going to show you in one sec kind of how we do this on an automated scale. But again, against Tenda, my favorite company to pick on. Um, let's talk stack buffer overflows in their HTTP daemon. Um, there's a string copy uh, in the SSID field that you can actually exploit just in BERT proxy, which I'm sure many of you have used between a user and um, the web UI on a device. So I'm just going to show you, and if any of you are interested, I'm happy to, the point of this talk isn't to dig deep on this tool, but um, just show you a little demo of it, of it. So what my team did is we took all those scripts, uh, things that we had written over the years, Python scripts, et cetera, to pull apart firmware, uh, put it in a web UI so that we can start. So this is, for example, that links this firmware that I looked through, um, and we can find 
you know, okay, all of those libraries in the slash lib directory, all right, we know, so libcurl 5.3.0, cool, that's vulnerable to a whole bunch of CVEs. Um, the, um, you know, printf vulnerabilities in and where those are called. So this is something that, um, that we've been working on knowing that, you know, when you start doing this stuff, you wanna scale it up, start scripting it small and uh, put it all together into something that can start giving you these uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, I'll show at the end some of the stuff we've open sourced related to this. Um, and I will uh, show you a couple other techniques we can use. Cool. So again, you know, on the firmware side, script script things to any measure you can. Python scripts are great for looking through file systems, comparing strings, things like that. But what about hardware, right? How do we scale up hardware? Well, there are some really good tools out there already that we can use in a standardized way, like JTAGulator, finding the pinout on JTAG in an automated fashion. Um, JTAG enum, there's a serial enum to look at when you maybe have 20 pins exposed on a circuit board that you think might have debug functionality, which ones you can use. And that, that helps replace the tedious, slow process with a logic analyzer and microscope of figuring out what's connected to what. But um, as I mentioned earlier, one of my issues that I wanted to solve is how do we, how do we destroy fewer devices while we're doing hardware testing? Um, and I talked earlier about these serial consoles on devices. You know, that is, I'd say 50% of the time, the initial access that we can get to a device uh, to be able to do analysis against it. But manufacturers are starting to lock those down. So how do we get around those, uh, the way those are being locked down? So there's a really effective way to do it called a glitching attack. The basic premise, so we talked about the fact that, um, on the hardware, there's a flash memory chip with persistent storage, and that um, the firmware that's on that flash chip needs to get to the CPU during boot so that the whole boot process can actually happen. However, what we've found is that if you disrupt the communications between those at the right time, uh, the majority of devices fail into an open failure state where you can actually interact with it and do some interesting stuff with it. Um, now, the problem with this attack that we were finding is we were doing it by touching wires to pins on chips, and this was just not going great. It was destroying a lot of circuit boards. Um, so we paid the $4 to get a cool logo of something on Fiverr, totally worth it. Um, and we're going to open source a new tool that I'm about to demo to you called that we call Flash Bash, which is automated glitching to get to a root shell on embedded devices when these have um, when these have been locked down. So um, the way this works, so this is, sorry, this photo is blurry, but I'll show it to you in the real world in a sec. Um, when a device is booting, we can look for certain serial output to, in a very targeted way, do our glitching attack. To, get, to force the device at the right time to fail open. And we do that by, this is a logic analy analyzer trace. You know, you see the part of this uh, serial of this boot log that says verifying checksum. If we look at that on a logic analyzer trace, we see that when the device, uh, the top line here is that serial output, the other lines here are uh, the communication lines between the flash chip and the CPU. We see that after it says verifying checksum, about three characters after that, um, it starts sending the firmware from the uh, from from the uh, flash memory chip to the CPU. That is exactly the time that we want to initiate our attack. So let's get really targeted about this. I'm going to try and do a live demo. We'll see how it works because live demos with hardware are always fun. Um, so 
what I have in front of me, I will try and show all of this on a, so let me switch to terminal. So what I have in front of me again, so this is a, uh, the circuit board from a D-Link router. It's just a cheap standard device. The serial console on it is again, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's these, it's this four pin header at the side here that I have connected to a serial to USB adapter called an FTDI. Um, uh, but it didn't give us any interaction when the device booted up and uh, we wanted to get into this device and interact with it. Um, I have a little clip on the back that's clipped to the serial output pin of the flash memory chip. This is the pin over which all the data for the firmware is gonna come. On the other side of it, um, all this is connected to a Raspberry Pi um, with a little hat on it just for the wiring. Um, and but that's what we're SSH'd into right now that you see on terminal. So I'm gonna hook this up and I hope when I dropped it earlier and I said, oh crap, I dropped my demo that nothing broke. Um, so we're gonna hook all this up and we find the power cord for the router. So let me, uh, I'm gonna open Minicom because it's just opening our um, serial view for this device. Awesome. I'm gonna plug in this router and start it up and let's see what we see. Cool. Okay, we see some serial output. Awesome, we see that verifying checksum thing that I talked about earlier. Um, so now this is when the firmware is getting sent from that flash chip to the device. Um, all that's gonna happen. I'll let that happen and then uh, kill it, turn it off. Um, you know, we see some other information that if we were to let this boot fully um, would be useful to us, but that's fine. I just killed the power on the device just to show you. Gives us some serial output, but we can't. Um, we cannot uh, communicate with it. So I'm gonna open up a tool that we built that again is gonna be that we're open sourcing um, uh, with this Flash Bash project. And I'm gonna run, run this tool that we built. So when I run it, first thing it asks me, is what serial baud rate am I doing? Am I, it, does this device use? Um, these are a couple of standard ones. This device uses 38400. Awesome. Okay. Um, it asks for a serial device descriptor. This is just on what port is my serial device. Well, I know this is on dev TTY USB zero. Awesome. And then it says, what phrase would you like to glitch on? So we know based on that logic capture I showed you in the presentation that the serial data transmission starts at um, when we see checksum, right? So I'm gonna say, find the word checksum. When that happens, start sending electrical pulses to the serial output pin of that flash memory. So I say checksum there. What phrase would we like to see glitching on? Well, so I happen to know on this device, it's gonna drop me into a real tech console. So I'm gonna say real. We can also do this based on timing, glitch for five, 10 seconds, whatever we want, but I know that that's gonna happen. So um, it's ready to go. So what the device is doing now is sitting in a ready state, watching what's happening on dev TTY USB zero, looking for the characters, the ASCII characters check some over serial at which point it's gonna start sending pulses over the, uh, and grounding the, um, the serial output data pin. So let's see what happens here. And I hope it actually works. Okay, cool. We see it found checksum, initiated glitching. So we're repeatedly grounding and moving to 3.3 volts, the, um, the serial output pin or the flash right now. Glitched, cool. That means we found the statement real, awesome. I'm gonna exit out of this program and go back into Minicom. And hey, now I'm inter I can interact with this device over serial. I hit the question mark. This looks like I am in the bootloader's um, configuration menu. 
which otherwise I never would have been able to access because this is locked down in the default state on the device. Um, from here, I can set those environment variables, read and write memory, do things like that that I otherwise would not be able to do. Um, so, and that is one way. So using tools like this, and there are a lot of good things out there and we need a lot more like them, using tools like this that can really accurately um, control the uh, state of hardware and not destroy our devices, but give us as security researchers a leg up to automate our process to get into them. These are what are ultimately gonna make us successful here at doing this stuff at scale. So, um, I know I'm at about a minute till um, we wrap up for questions. Um, so, you know, what can we all do about this dumpster fire? Well, for the market pressure, help companies push their security processes into their R&D. Um, keep doing what we're doing today. Um, build more tools, open source more tools. Um, and if you're the ones building these things, always think hardware first um, on security really starting with chip selection. So, you know, back to those key con uh, the key concepts from the beginning, we talked about large attack surfaces, but they are manageable with the right tools and analysis, but you have to get it right from the start. Those hardware constraints are gonna limit our capabilities, um, but they provide us opportunities to push the chip vendors to say, hey, every device needs secure boot, needs a secure enclave for the encryption keys. Um, and yeah, this is going to get worse, but some vendors are starting to get with the programs and with better tools to understand and test the stuff, we can do it right. Um, I'll plug some open source resources. Again, these uh, these will be available, uh, but also some open source um, hardware tools that um, I'll update this link once we put this flash bash tool on GitHub next week. Um, and some firmware tools uh, related to our automation and also our hardware hacking 101 series that um, me and my team wrote on how to get started with this stuff and walk you through some tutorials. Um, if you're interested in, in trying out the firmware automation stuff I mentioned, feel free to ping me. Um, and that's about it. I'll be on Discord today. Uh, shoot me an email, Twitter, et cetera. So. All right, all. Jeff, thank you so very much for uh, for your time and your and your uh, and your knowledge. Uh, one quick question: What's the uh, mountain behind you? I'm a ski instructor, so I was noticing the picture behind you, and I'm like, okay, we're not too far away, maybe. Yeah, no, no, that's that's New Hampshire, where I where I would probably rather be right now. Um, so that is uh, Lonesome Lake in uh, Lincoln, and the background is, I guess, the uh, Franconia Ridge. So. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ski club in the area there, uh, uh, North Woodstock. There. All right. Well, oh. again, thank you. Hey, hey, everybody. Uh, Jeff, Jeff's uh, presentation is being recorded. Uh, give the folks from uh, B sides Boston a couple of weeks. They're gonna put everything out online, uh, the slides and and the and the recordings. Uh, Jeff, you have a chance to decompress now. We thank you and everybody else. Uh, enjoy enjoy the rest of the day and. Um, Hey, you know, this craziness will end at one point. <laughs>